Hello and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and I'm very glad you're joining us again today. Today we are going to be continuing our theme, our ongoing theme of caring for the environment, of paying attention to the environment, to ecosystems, and all of the implications and ramifications of not taking care of it and is really the equivalent of not taking care of ourselves and our future, ourselves, our own, as well as those of future generations. Today's show specifically is going to be looking at the disappearance of the bees across the world, and will therefore then, from that place, develop into a discussion about new methods of food production, because at the end of the day, that's what we've got to do, move away from agribusiness as we know it into a different kind of more sustainable methodology. And therefore, today's show is called What's the Buzz? Mitchell interviews journalist, author, and poet Richard Schiffman about bees and about these other wonderful subjects about which Richard has been writing for a while with his work having appeared in the New York Times, Salon, the Washington Post, the Christian Science Monitor, the Huffington Post, NPR, and Monitor Radio, and beyond, Truth Out, etc. Richard is a very dear colleague and friend of mine who has been on A Better World Radio before, some years back, in fact, and uh, has been really very dedicated to bringing forward to our world a lot of information that isn't actually so popular. Uh, But when he brings it forward, it really does start another kind of buzz. And many people have benefited from Richard's uh, serious research. So Richard Schiffman, welcome to A Better World. Thanks. Thanks, Mitchell. Great to be here. I'm so glad. It's so much fun to come to a better world, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think we're overdue, don't you? I do, I do, (laughs) which is why I'm doing what I'm doing. you've You've been doing it for a while, but I mean, the world hasn't totally caught up yet, but I think we're getting there. Yeah, I think that there's a little opening, there's a little crack in the facade, you know, slowly and surely. Richard, you've been doing such good work, and I know you've written um, several articles on on the bees, uh, one of which is called Mystery of the Disappearing Bees Solved, and just coming from uh, my other radio show, uh, Progressive Radio Network's Progressive Film Hour with Mitchell Rabin, we we're focusing on the really award-winning film called Vanishing of the Bees. And I want to just share with our audience uh, the first paragraph of your film, of your film, I'm sorry, to be known, it will happen, but of your, oh, sure. your article that was uh, published by Reuters magazine. Uh, if it were, and this is a quote from Richard's article, Mystery of the Disappearing Bees uh, in Reuters, If it were a novel, people would criticize the plot for being too far-fetched. Thriving colonies disappear overnight without leaving a trace. The bodies of the victims are never found. Only in this case, it's not fiction. It's what's happening to fully a third of commercial beehives, over a million colonies every year. Seemingly healthy communities fly off never to return. The queen bee and mother of the hive is abandoned to starve and die. Whoa, uh. what an <laughs> opening. I, I don't know if I'm reeling, reading Sherlock Holmes or what. You know, exactly. Well, you know, it's, it's been, Tell it's us about been it. a real scientific detective story for the last several years. And, uh, you know, I, I have to say, Mitchell, sometimes... Uh, headlines are misleading, even my own. <laughs> yes. Yes. In this way, you know, the headline was that the mystery was solved, but in fact, only part of the mystery was solved. We now know that a uh, certain type of pesticides called neon- neonics are partly mm. responsible for the dying of the bees, 
but it's only part of the story. And, you know, recent research indicates that there may be more to it, that uh, the way that bees are, are treated could be, uh, you know, largely responsible for their the weakening of their immune systems, which is leading yeah. to the die-off. The way they're treated, so you mean, not, on a commercial level, Richard? It's, it's one of, what's that? Oh. Uh, the way that you said it, it's in part the pesticides, uh, but it's right. also part the way they're treated. Do you mean on a commercial level? Right, exactly. Being trucked well, across so, the country. Yeah. You know, isn't it amazing that these tiny little creatures are literally trucked across the country and they don't even have, uh, you know, get to go on a potty stop? They they don't go, yes. to, go to the bathroom because bees are very clean animals and they don't go to the bathroom in their own hives. So this yes. is really stressful for the bees. Yes, That's one exactly. Thing. And another thing yeah. is that they're fed sugar water with antibiotics in it, the way that, uh, you know, other commercially uh, farmed animals are, are cattle or fish, uh, you know, farmed fish yes. and so on. And for sure, you know, first of all, sugar water... Can you imagine what would happen to us if we only drank sugar water? Well, it's kind of similar for bees. You know, bees need a, a varied diet, and they're not getting it in the commercial system. They're only, you know, drinking this very limited sugar water, which gives them their energy needs, but not the nutrition that they need to be fully healthy. And so that's another thing is they're not getting the, the proper diet. And then when they're released, you know, the bees may be released in, say, an almond field in California, and they're only going to the almond flowers. Now, in nature, bees have many different type of wildflowers that they go to, so they have a varied diet, which is so important for all you know living things to have a varied diet. Well, bees yes. don't get it. And so this is a big part of you know the fact that their immune systems are getting weaker. So one of the things that they're noticing over the winter when all these uh, colony, you know, when 30% of the colonies die, is that the queens are often very weak, and this is partly responsible for for the lar you know, the high mortality rate of the bees, is that the queens themselves become very weak, and and I suspect, and you know, a lot of scientists and researchers who've been looking into this also suspect that uh, a large part of it is the the diet and the treatment that the bees. Uh, have to undergo as part of this industrial agricultural system. And I think it's really interesting. I mean, I think some of the listeners may be familiar with Rudolf Steiner. I know that you are. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Well, Steiner said, you know, like at the beginning of the 20th century, he said, in the future, the stress of the industrial way of keeping bees is going to lead to their extinction. Now, this was like 100 years ago at this point oh my. when Steiner made this prediction. And mm. I think that he was spot on, and I think it's the whole industrial system of, of raising the bees and the, the way that they're treated. I think it's the whole deal. It's not just the pesticide. The pesticide is part of it, but it's only part of the, the puzzle, I think. Yes, I think that's a very good point. What you're really kind of putting forth, Richard, is this kind of gestalt, a, a holistic, integrative understanding of what affects the immune system, um, the nervous system, the circulatory system, the digestive system of all living creatures. And we're all sort of in this cage in some ways. When you industrialize a community, uh, when you industrialize food, I think that's one of the things uh, – the, the fallout that we're seeing today, both in the bee community, bee colonies, and elsewhere. As you said, they are trucking thousands of beehives across the country to almond, uh, almond field, I'm uh, not fields, I'm sorry, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, groves. Close to the almond orchards. Groves, yeah, I mean, there are these huge orchards, orchards these uh, uh, almond blueberry, orchards. Blueberry. Strawberry, exactly. These, as right, you said, right. monocultures, because that's the that's the industrial linear, you know, number crunching accounting model of the food business. But 
food is everyone's business, you know, and it's not business like let's make money, business, i.e. we better have good food in order to live and survive, you know, so we're dealing with... I don't don't know about you, Mitchell, but honey is one of my favorites. I mean, I even put it in coffee. Oh, me too. And, 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 you know, something... Something else. I mean, since we're we're talking about bees and and what wonderful creatures they are, you know, I would I would say to your to our listeners right now, be careful about yes. what kind of honey you buy because a lot of honey is produced in China and it's adulterated with uh, water and it's also uh, adulterated with uh, pesticides and antibiotics. Uh, the bees are not treated very syrup. well all over the world. Yeah, corn syrup, right? Exactly. It's 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 mixed with uh, other forms of sugar like corn syrup, and uh, exactly. So I think we want to be careful about that. So I I would That's say a you know very good point. personally I just go for organic, uh, yes. farm farm raised uh, honey. And yeah, I don't go I you know because really the, the big brands, the big brands that you find in the supermarkets. What's that? Uh, that's the only Sorry. safe way these days. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I would be careful. You about know, but that. the point I wanted to make, Richard, here that you're raising of looking at the pesticides in addition to the treatment you said of these bees, um, them being caged, they're being highly hygienic and being caged up in a truck. Um, shipped across thousands of miles where they don't have a chance to kind of excrete in the way they would in a natural context uh, is just they're, they're soiling their own home, their own nest, quite literally, their own beehive. And right. this kind of systemic abuse is the same thing that uh, is done on factory farms, is done in prisons, uh, you know, in human prisons, and it's actually done. All of us are in some kind of stressed situation in our current world. I, I really make the case that what exactly. with the, I, you know, the uh, specter I of you, you, nuclear, just nuclear, forget about nuclear arms, just nuclear energy that here in New York City we live with Indian Point, nuclear plant 19 miles away from the epicenter of Manhattan. When you contemplate that, you know, is it so easy to sleep? Yeah. Yes, please go on. <laughs> you know, I, I think you know. we are the new bees, Mitchell. You know, that's the thing. That's why yes. people relate to their plight so much because, as you know, you were just yes. saying, that's right. uh, we, we can relate to what's happening to them because it's happening to all of nature and it's, it's ultimately happening exactly. to the human beings because the way we treat nature is a reflection of how we treat ourselves you know that's exactly right and there's just not enough love richard there's a, too much profit in front of people too much profit before nature it just it just it's so irrational for a people that a species that has been granted the opportunity for conscious mentation this is what we've done with it we've made a piece of paper called money a god over the living reality of of flesh and bone and spirit you know in action it's just it's rather extraordinary because our potential is so great yet we've sold out for uh something really relatively speaking so low but you deal with these issues routinely in your writing and bees of course you've written just delightfully um and very engagingly about the disappearance of the bees and i mean before moving on to some other uh related subjects i'd like you to just if you would say what is the upside that you see relative to what's happening with beekeeping across the country and the world well i you know one thing is that the uh the number of cases of colony collapse disorder is uh diminishing a bit so yeah. it's and the the current thinking you know when i did a little research before this interview just to get up to speed the current thinking yes. seems to be that the problem is not so much colony collapse but the whole way that we're 
you know, keeping the bees and, and the whole industrial agricultural system that they're a part of. So I think that's mm-hmm. hopeful, you know, that, that scientists are now recognizing that uh, that we need to look at, at, at the, these more systemic issues. Uh, and for sure, I mean, I know that uh, beekeeping is an amazing type of thing that uh, some of my friends out in New Mexico are getting into it's just uh mm-hmm. i mean they're just mm-hmm. they're just miraculous creatures and yes. uh and i yes, think that are. you know for me the the whole thing it's, it's kind of like a symbol bees in a way are the canaries in the coal mine of the ecosystem yes they're they're yes. very you know they're kind of uh uh to mix a metaphor, as fragile. Said, yeah, they're, 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 they're a vulnerable. They're a vulnerable species. Yes, they are. And the trouble that they're having, it's sort of like uh, an alarm signal that we have to yes. clean up our act as far as you know the way that we treat the environment. So I, I'd say that that's sort of the, the silver lining, if you you know, yes. of, of the whole situation yes. is that it's it's causing people to wake up and i know that you know that when i whenever i write about bees i got a huge response i think that people really relate to this issue and they they see it as you know just that as as kind of a symbol for what we're doing to the world yeah so i think that I that's, think you're right. that's hopeful i think you're right that is a hopeful thing i always scratch my head and wonder why it has to take the near decimation of a species for people to say oh my god you know what We've got a problem on our hands. Like one of the great aspects of the human mind and brain system that supports that mind is uh, the idea of foresight. This is what has come to us from Prometheus, you know, from ancient Greek mythology, the ability to see ahead of time and to recognize consequences potential consequences and for some reason that kind of of use of the mind is just not um pervasive it's not prominent just yet so it's always like from behind uh, oh my god that's what would happen if you know now what's particularly serious about the b question is that it's because of pollination that we have virtually all of our fruits and vegetables. That consists of probably 70 to 80% of our entire food chain for humans, you know. Well, it's about, and, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not quite that high. It's about uh, 30% of fruits and vegetables, and, and there's some big ones there. there there's, uh, well, almonds we mentioned uh, there would be no almonds without these commercial beekeepers. Uh, but there's broccoli, Brussels sprouts, uh, I mean, the, the list goes on. The, all, all of the beans that we eat are are basically uh, pollinated by bees, turnips, ca- cauliflower, celery, <laughs> strawberries. So, you know, if you took a picture of, of your supermarket uh, uh, produce yeah. section without the 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 fruits and vegetables that are pollinated by bees it would be it would be pretty sad it would be pretty meager yes, it you know be. it's interesting mitchell i don't know if you're aware of this but in china which is talking about you know the uh uh canary I know where you're mine, going. But, but in a way like I china is going. china is already that canary is already dying you know environmentally china's got some really big problems in china there are areas where the bees are gone where human beings are pollinating the fruits. Yeah. Can you believe that? Humans are actually I do. pollinating I've seen the, the fruits footage. In, in areas of China. <laughs> I think that's well, what they're extraordinary. Doing, and <laughs> they're actually emulating, Richard, as I know you know this, they're emulating, they're building suits, um, and they're emulating the bee. And they cannot, they have found, perform the functions of a bee a fraction as well as a bee can, even with well, exactly. all of our technology, right? <laughs> I mean, it looks exactly. I mean, who do you think does it better, bees or humans, you know, as far as pollination goes? So. <laughs> it's it's so almost I think we better, like a I, bad I think the message play. Is we, we better keep the bees unless we want to, you know, spend like the... Uh, most of our remaining lives pollinating uh, crops, you know. 
<laughs> exactly. Uh, it's. I think the ratio is something uh, absolutely radical. Like you know what a bee can do in an hour, it would take us about twelve or fourteen days, and we still can't do all that they've done in an hour. You know, after all, one bee can pollinate a hundred thousand flowers in one day. How could a human being? You know, it just. Exactly, and I don't think humans are too good at making honey either, but uh, last time I checked. Exactly. exactly. So, the whole thing so is so preposterous. We, so, yeah. we need the bees. You know, it's interesting. The uh, African killer bees that have such a bad reputation, they are thriving. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think this is really interesting because it shows that bees in the wild, you know, with strong genes, they, they're still doing well. But the the bees that we have, we've been breeding, you know, these, these commercial bees for, for many, many generations. And another thing that happens is when you breed small populations, you keep on breeding them, their genetics weakens. So, you know, I mean, that's why yeah. we don't marry our cousins, right? Because our, yeah. genetic, our genetics would weaken and we'd become more susceptible to all sorts of genetic diseases. Well, I think the same thing is happening to the bees when they're uh, uh, when they're bred by by humans instead of naturally in nature, their their genetic uh, vitality diminishes. And, yes, and I'm I sure that this right is happening it. with uh, other farm animals as well, or, or fish, you know, who, that are yes. now being farmed. I think that after generations and generations, their genetics becomes becomes very weak. Well, what you're pointing something out that's very, very vital to the entire ecosystem, Richard, and is one of the great gifts of the, if you want to call it, experiment of nature over hundreds of millions of years at this point um, in its intelligence figuring out what survives and what thrives and what does not and why. And we are uh, one of the end products of that. Uh, it's amazing that we have actually survived um, based on a lot of data. But uh, is the fundamental principle of biodiversity. And biodiversity allows for um, diverse adaptation to changing worldly, earthly conditions. And when you uh, monocrop um, or mono farm or mono raise, uh, you know, animals, farm animals, or you genetically modify, you are reducing nature's greatest method to adapt to changing conditions, which is diversity. And it's well, exactly. as though the entire, right, the entire agri-industrial complex is 180 degrees in opposition to that. And then to kill it, you know, you could think of pesticides as, you know, agricultural chemotherapy. And if the food manages to survive the pesticide, just as if a human being manages to survive the chemotherapy and radiation um, in cancer treatment, then voila, we have a success or the patient dies or the field dies. And then we're right, left. Right. I mean, it's probably the most primitive part of our brain that has come up with this as a solution. Now, you're doing some interesting research into, uh, first of all, let me let everyone know you are listening to A Better World with Mitchell J. Rabin. We're on every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please go to our newsletter, a betterworld.tv, our website, and join our free newsletter. Pick it up and forward this link to your friends so they can all see it and, you know, do all the social media stuff that people do these days so you can hear the information and the education that we offer here with such guests as today's guest, Richard Schiffman, journalist, author, uh, and um, environmentalist at large who's just done such really excellent work. Today we're speaking about bees, but now we're going to move into Another interesting thing that's going on, well, first of all, there's something called holistic beekeeping, which is where the beekeepers are uh, raising a hive or two for themselves, not a 1,000 hives, not 3,000 hives, 
but they're doing what they're doing locally for their own family, for their local community, and that's changing the game on Be Thriving. Can you comment on that? Uh, well, I I think that's great. You know, I mean, I, I think that for the big cash crops, like we, we talked about the almonds and the broccoli and uh, the cabbage, yeah. Uh, they're still trucking in the bees, but I think that oh, they you sure know, are. That, that, yeah, that yeah, continues. Yeah. You know that that, that industry be, is pretty strong, and and uh, and uh, as we were saying before, you know, I think they they need to start reforming themselves the way a lot of industrial yeah. agriculture needs to. Uh, but exactly. yeah, for sure, you know, just just like organic, you know, people are are growing their own food organically, and and, and there are a lot of small farms like where I go go in New Mexico in the summer there are these small co-op farms that maybe have five or ten acres and yet uh, supply you know literally hundreds of people with fresh organic fruits and vegetables and I think that I'm sure that the same thing is happening in in the bee world that you know there are small operators who uh, it may not be their the whole of their business but you know and they don't keep hundreds of hives so they don't have to treat the bees in the same way you know yes. they can treat them humanely if you only have a few hives you can be very careful in, in the way you treat them but if you have a thousand hives and you're trucking it you know across country it, it's going to necessitate yes. a, a different kind of handling for sure that's right that's right now you're in that, I mean, i mean basically what we're talking about is a change in consciousness a change which would then precipitate a change in values and moving from what has become this uh, kind of industrial headset that more is better on all levels when we know that that's really fundamentally untrue and we have a world that really reflects that. A world shows, gives us the feedback that bigger is not better and Every, it, the bigger is actually uh, should be really called unmanageable, uncontrollable, and um, and perhaps even fatal because that's what's happening to our ecosystem at large. And when right. people really think and use their their prefrontal cortex, you know, and their creative juice to to reflect on, contemplate what we're doing to our beautiful sacred earth. We come back with, we've got to go local. We've got to go back to the way things were before we allowed um, systemic globalization to occur, which has enslaved millions of people across the, the world, including children, especially women. I mean, th there's really no benefit except for buying what looks like products cheap. But the story of stuff and many others like it have shown us that there's nothing cheap at all. It's actually much more expensive. It's just subsidized through different forms of human slavery and uh, environmental destruction. But you're on to something, Richard, that outlines a new way of doing um, organic agricultural food, let's call it food production, and one of the things you were telling me recently, I'd love for you to share with the audience, is something that's going on in um, in Asian countries regarding rice production. Right, right. Well, it, this is very interesting. This is called the system of rice intensification, and uh, it's pretty controversial in in the scientific and you know the scientific agriculture world at the moment. Uh, but it's not controversial with farmers who see the results, basically they're getting double, sometimes triple the yields of rice from the old way. Now, the old way of growing rice was you flooded the paddy field and you planted the uh, rice stalks, very, uh, saplings, very close to one another. And then, you know, they would grow in the water and, and they would produce, and you, you would also use uh, agrochemicals to control pests and so on and uh, artificial petroleum-based fertilizers. So that's the old way, you know, the old industrial mm -hmm. agricultural way of growing rice. Well, what uh, a, a Jesuit uh, monk 
of all people, discovered in Madagascar is that if you don't flood the paddies, you don't use the chemical fertilizers, but you use the rice stalks themselves, you, you space the, uh, the, the seedlings far apart rather than clumping them together, uh, if, and, you know, basically kind of an organic, natural way of growing rice, what he discovered is that this was producing much better yields and much stronger plants because, uh-huh. hey, you know, uh, it's, if you were a rice plant, you wouldn't want to have to live in, in waterlogged uh, conditions. <laughs> so the, the rice plant actually thrives when it's not flooded and when it's not uh, overwhelmed with these other artificial inputs. And so uh, Vietnam, which is like a really big rice producer, has sure. observed what's going on. And they, they, they have, uh, as official policy, they say within the next 10 years, they're going to transform 30% of their agricultural land over to this new way of growing rice called the system of rice intensification. And other countries as well, in fact, it's even being used for other types of uh, uh, food crops. In Ethiopia, the main food crop is teff. Teff is, you know, kind of a a grain that's used to make the uh, injera, the bread of Ethiopia. Well, they're finding that the same methods work for uh, teff and other crops as well. So this is this is I think a really big deal in agriculture. This is like third world countries are beginning to find out that hey wait a second the, the, these industrial agricultural methods are not necessarily better. That these simpler, more organic ways of growing can actually produce uh, better results. And so yeah, I'm so I'm really excited about this story. And as I say, it's, you know, it's kind of controversial, and you can kind of uh, guess why it's controversial. There's no money in it for the big yeah. seed and agrochemical uh, companies because yeah. they can't sell you their chemicals or their fertilizers anymore because right. the farmers are pr- making their own fertilizer with the rice husks, yeah. and they're not using the chemicals. They don't need to use the chemicals to control pests because the plants are so healthy that they don't need to be, uh, you know, you don't need to spray them with uh, herbicides or pesticides. So So it's it's pretty controversial, but the good news is that it's being taken up by, like, really great organizations like Oxfam. It's one of Oxfam's uh, sort of uh, central agricultural programs now is is Mm -hmm. spreading a system of rice intensification, and Cornell University, which is uh, in New York State, is has a whole uh, division now dedicated to uh, propagating and studying this new way of rice cultivation. So, you know, I mean, it's just it's one thing, but I think it's uh, uh, it's a good sign. It's a good sign that that uh, that people are beginning to move in this new direction. And seeing that it can yes. produce better results. I mean, you know, the the industrial agriculture always claims, well, you know, organic and these other methods. Well, they're all well and good, but you, but you know, the yields will be much much smaller, and so that they're not economically viable. But I think that this new uh, way of growing rice just proves that that's not true. It's not true. <clears throat> you know. Richard, it's as though the world is coming out of a very deep trance. It's been hypnotized by the agri-industry, by the pharmaceutical industry, by the chemical industry, and uh, the military industry. You name it, you know, the pillars. And it uses standard mainstream media as its tool for the operation. And it is an operation. It's as though we were all given cataracts or something. <laughs> so <laughs> the traditional farming methods, of traditional ways of beekeeping, the traditional ways of living have been completely marginalized, made minuscule, miniaturized, and propagandized virtually out of existence. I mean, another example of that is, you know, the... Uh, the Dr. Spock phenomenon in the uh, what was it in the in the 1940s and then 50s that it was a bad thing to breastfeed your baby 
instead, of course, give it, um, you know, uh, what's a formula? Everyone knows that. Oh, my God. Or even a vaginal birth, for that matter. Why would you do that when you can do a cesarean? Well, there's a, an enormous amount of information and evidence that has come out finally these days that show what the hazards are of C-sections. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's all, you know, you use the word symbolic at the beginning of this dialogue about the bees and what's happened to the bees. And the bees are us, basically, you were saying. And uh, I agree with you. And I think that we're, our society is actually replete with symbols of how we continue to insist upon going against nature instead of in alignment with and harmony with nature. And we have a dear price to pay for it, literally a dear price. But now that the hypnosis is beginning to fade, just beginning to fade, with some of us it's long gone, but others, we're all <laughs> subject to various little aspects of it. Um, I just would like to ask you, you know, if you think about agribusiness um, and uh, industrial, you know, farming, it's actually only been with us for a very short period of time, historically speaking. Did the Africans in Ethiopia and elsewhere and the Asians uh, used to do what is now being done and generated by, you know, the likes of this uh, Jesuit priest or Cornell University? Well, it's funny you should ask, because I have a Cambodian friend who I told about this new way of uh, growing rice, and she got very indignant. I think you know her, Fobal, Fobal Cheng. I do very, very well. Wonderful, Fobal wonderful Cheng, woman, sure. a former diplomat. Anyway, I told her about Truly. this new way, and she got very kind of incensed, and she said, no, it's not new. We knew about it in Cambodia for centuries. <laughs> yes. So uh, yes. whether it was exactly the same way of growing rice or not, I'm not sure. But right. but in any case, I think the point, the point was well taken that uh, – a lot of these methods that we're rediscovering now, I mean, they're, they're basically old ways of doing things in, in harmony yeah. with nature back, back in the days when, you know, humans, that's, that's the way we lived. We lived in, in yes. a lot more harmony with nature than we do yes, today. Yes, exactly. Well, that's actually nice to hear that that's the case, um, you know, that this knowledge was, is in a sense being revived, but there there is a new twist that I think is very valuable, and that's the kind of the combining of the ancient indigenous wisdom with modern thinking, creativity, and technology. Sometimes, you see, this is the thing: you never want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The problem, I I put it this way, and I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. It's not the technology itself. It's not even a profit motive, which is ancient as well. Um, but it's a sense of moderation, of balance between the elements. Um, you know, someone I just recently introduced you to, David Christopher, who wrote the book The Holy Universe, who I've had on these airwaves uh, just earlier this this year. Just a delightful man who's very involved in the new story being weaved uh, between uh, our ancient selves and our modern selves, and what story emerges when you tell uh, that tale, if you will, of the interface of the ancient understanding of the web of life combined with our own technological drive. What is the place right, of right. meeting? Well, I, I agree you know? with you totally, Mitchell, that, that, that you know, it's, it's not a question of getting rid of technology. It's we need to use technology in a new way, you know, and I think yeah. that it's already beginning. I mean, you see, for instance, uh, designers are looking at organisms for for hints about how to design things that will be useful for humanity. Yeah. I mean, there was one, right. one story I recently Mimetics did for Mimetics and Biomimicry, magazine. for instance. Yeah, exactly. So, so like for Sierra, I did, uh, uh, I, I did a story about Get, uh, taking water out of the air, they're called fog catchers. And what yes. uh, what they noticed was that there was this beetle in South Africa that lived in the driest desert, one of the driest deserts in the world in Namibia. And they're wondering, now, how is this 
beetle surviving. It needs water. Well, they found that when the fog would come in from the uh, South Atlantic Ocean, the beetle would stick its back up right into the fog, and the drops uh, from the fog would, would coalesce on, on its skin, you know, and uh, go right into the, the moist moisture. mouth. So it was drinking, yeah, the moisture yeah. was drinking the, that moisture uh, that yeah. was dripping down its back from the fog that was, uh, you know, uh, forming on yeah. the back of its, its carapace. Yeah. So based on, on this observation, they created a way of taking water out of fog, you know, of, of extracting water from yeah. fog by by facing it into uh, ocean winds and uh, creating materials that were like the carapace of the beetle that basically attracted the water and, and you know, made it into drops and, and then using that water for human purposes. So here's an example of, of where we're working with nature where technology is created that's mimicking nature and working yeah. with and, 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 and not, you know, interfering with things. So I yeah. think that that's totally possible. And, and these, you know, I mean, like the, the way of uh, uh, growing rice that we talked about, it's also a technology. You know, it's human beings taking a plant that uh, existed in a very different form in nature and, and it was developed over gener so many generations into the rice plant that we know today and then planting it in very specific ways that create uh, the best yields. I mean, these are technologies. But the, the, the question is, is the technology working with nature or is the technology working against nature? And I think that's the question that we have to ask, you know, going forward. Yes, I agree. I agree. That would knock genetically modified organisms sort of out of the box very quickly because uh, tomato genes never belonged in a flounder, for instance. Right, right. Well, and, uh, in fact, you know, the people know about GMOs, but uh, they're not as aware of the fact that, did you know that, that we're producing a lot of uh varieties of fruits and vegetables by exposing seeds to high levels of radiation. Uh, and I, I've forgotten the name of that process, but it's uh, because, you know, when, when seeds or, or when any living organism is exposed to high levels of radiation, it creates, uh, 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 what do you call it, you know, uh, it distorts the gene, it creates... Uh, Yes. new forms of the gene. And so yes. these seeds are being uh, exposed to the radiation in order, you know, kind of like just throwing this, this energy at the seeds to make them change, yes. to make them, uh, uh, you know, different forms. And yes. this too, mutation. you know, I mean... Is yeah, the word mutation, you're looking for? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Right. Yeah. Right. So... Yeah. Uh, so the radiation is being used to mutate the, the seeds, and, uh, you know, that's something we should probably be looking at. I'm not sure that that's the best idea in the world, you know. <laughs> yes, you put that in well, there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of things. I mean, GMO is one technology, but there's a lot of technologies that are working in ways that sort of distort nature or, or do violence to nature. And I think that... Any technology that that does violence and is aggressive against nature, I mean, there's there's going to be uh, a blowback from that, you know. Yes, indeed, indeed. I think that's what we're learning that there has to be harmony on all levels. That you know, there's a fundamental uh, kind of a notion that showed up in the Old Testament which is usually translated as man having dominion over nature. And this is a heated and hotly disputed kind of a translation. And does that mean what we've turned it into meaning? Or is dominion in this case possibly not the exact translation, as I've heard it said, but rather that we might be uh, a pinnacle 
but that doesn't mean to dominate. It's a very different idea. Right, right. Let's but say, you know, you know that... You, you introduced yeah, me, Mitchell, to uh, Dwayne Elgin. Uh, yes. Some of our listeners may be familiar with Dwayne. Well, anyway, He's been Dwayne on a better world. A, he's, he's a wonderful man. Oh, yeah, yeah, a, a great man and a great thinker. And, and he did a, a poll, he, he sponsored this poll, worldwide poll, where they asked people, what stage do you think humanity as a whole is in? And they gave, like, four choices. I think it was child, adolescent, uh, mature person, or, or wise elder. Well, yes. what? Uh, well, let me ask our listeners right now. What, what do you think 75% of, of uh, people who were polled said? Well, okay, it's pretty obvious, right? We're in the adolescent stage, okay? Yeah. So yeah. it's like... Adolescence, in a well, way, somewhere between to, somewhere between child and adolescent, I would vote for. May, may, maybe early adult. Well, 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 let's hope. Let's hope yeah. we're, we're 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 growing up. But because yeah. you know the thing is that okay, so adolescents they need to prove themselves, right, and and to yeah. make their mark in the world and separate from their family. Well, in the same way, you know, the human race in its adolescence has is, is wanted to prove itself and separate itself from the family of life and, and say, no, we're unique, we're different, you know, we want to, we're, we're in charge here. So that's sort yes. of the adolescent, that's the adolescent hubris and the adolescent pride, you know. Yes. It's like we've gotten to a point where that's led us to the edge of environmental disaster. So we need to grow up quickly. Quickly. <laughs> so I'm hoping you're wrong about early adolescence. I'm hoping it's later adolescence, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we're getting ready to to find a more mature adult story, which is no longer about dominating nature, but about living in harmony and partnership with nature as an equal, not not as yes. like we're the boss and you're the slaves. You know, that's yes. the old story, the old model. And Thomas Berry, I think. You, I'm sure you know about Thomas Berry. Well, he was a great Catholic theologian who talked about yes. the fact that we need a new story. And the new story, it has to be a new scientific story, a new religious story, a new artistic story. We need to, it, it has to be across disciplines that we tell a new story about what we're doing here as human beings. And who what, we are. What life is all about. Yeah, who we are and, yeah. and, and, and what life is all about. And uh, And Berry said that when we tell this new life-affirming cooperative story about our, our human place in the universe, that will be when we reach adulthood and we're finally mm. able to, to live in, in harmony with the world. Mm. And uh, Beautiful. I think Barry's right, you know, and I just hope, yeah. you know, I mean, there are signs that, that a lot of us are beginning to reach adulthood, right? So Yes. The question is, when will there be a critical mass, right, <laughs> of, yes. of adults rather than rather than adolescents? So there's nothing wrong with adolescence. You know, our collective adolescence has gotten us where we are, which is not all bad. You know, it's like we have this no. incredible world that we've created. You know, uh, 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 that that we enjoy. But we just we just need to have a mid course correction. It's not that we need to get rid of our science and technology. We just need to not at all use them in a new for new purpose right. and in a new way. You know, to live with, in harmony I like with that. nature, not against it. A mid course correction. I love that. <laughs> it's a great right, way to put it, right. Richard. <laughs> it's really true. That is what we need. I I I remark on this whole conversation we're having now uh very often in my own mind i have these conversations there are many of us here that i converse with internally as we're always debating <laughs> where we are in the direction of either the sixth epoch as it's called where we have uh, we enter an enlightened stage of being and development or we enter the sixth extinction and where we just go poof you know, sayonara, another experiment down the drain by nature, and it was called yeah, the, 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 the being, jury is you know. still out on that one, huh? <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. I mean, and uh, you know, it's like it thank, could it could go it could go either way. It could go either yeah, way. Yeah, it really could. Yeah, it but really could. But there's almost could. no I, other choice. There's almost no other choice because if we don't clean up our act, we're on a collision yeah. course for for you know totally changing the climate. 
wiping out uh, a majority of the species that are alive today, uh, destroying whole habitats and ecosystems, and 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 just you know creating a, a situation in, in which human life might be very difficult to sustain. You know, I agree. I I I muse about this so often. Uh, there is so much good that's happening. Uh, I often make reference to uh, Paul Hawkins' Blessed Unrest um, and the work that I have uh, been exposed to through the Pachamama Alliance that has assembled some wonderful footage of amazing things going on across the planet. In Paul Hawkins' book, I think when it was written, there were approximately 200,000 organizations, NGOs, uh, different nonprofits, and what are referred to these days as social enterprise businesses that are just remarkably advancing uh, these values that you and I are speaking about here, Richard, of, of harmony and sustainable relationship to our environment and to each other and a, a proper rejuxtaposition of values and um the question becomes is it too little too late that's of course a question that that hangs in the balance right now i i have put all of my forces and energy and attention and belief system and that of a better world behind the idea that we're going to get through this uh, Gary Knoll brings up a very interesting point, which is that we have passed certain tipping points. And I think that uh, James Hansen, uh, you know, former NASA climatologist, would say the same thing, and many others. There were tipping points that were articulated back in the early 80s, if not before, of regarding climate change and ecosystem collapse of one level or another. I don't right. think there's right. ever going to be a return to life exactly as it was, um, kind of climatically. Uh, but it seems that we haven't gone too far where everything, pardon the expression, goes south. You know, we can still live, but, you know, the ice is melting, the currents are changing, you know, sea rise is happening you know, we can't fool ourselves that we haven't passed certain tipping points. But have we well, passed exactly. the last and, and one for extinction yeah. remains to be seen. Excuse me? Right. Well, I was just going to say that, comment? you know, sometimes people people used to talk just a few years ago, even, you know, as a journalist, I used to write about preventing climate change. Well, that's off the table now. There's no way we're going to prevent it. It's actually with us already. Exactly. The, the, the climate exactly. is changing. And and not only that, but, you know, the CO2 does not degrade in the atmosphere very quickly. So even if we stopped, I mean, if we stopped tomorrow putting uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, we'd still have global warming for the next 50 years or so because that's just for the, sure. the nature of the way the CO2 is going to stay up there and, and continue exactly. to uh, create this extra heat in our environment. So there's no way that we're going and, to prevent and species it. Species extinction. You know, that, what's that? And species extinction. You yeah, know, exactly. there's no there's species, species extinction. It's the same. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. It's already I mean, happening. That, you can't exactly. In fact, they yeah. say that oh. literally within the next 50 years, 50 approximately. And I, I get the numbers off sometimes because I'm not a statistician, but it's approximately within 50 years. I think it's actually more by 2050, 50% 50 of the animals that we know today, and I'm talking about lions and tigers and bears and elephants, will be gone. Gone at the current rate of destruction, of ecological destruction that we are looking right. at today. Right. It's so, so the bad news is it's that the climate change and species uh, extinction is 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 going to happen. Uh, but the but the thing is that that it's up to us, you know, how soon how soon we start moving in a new direction. You know, it's like we're not at a place in terms of climate change. Uh, we're, we're we're not at a place where we need to 
destroy life on Earth, right? We're still at a place right. where if we cut back, and there's some there's some signs even of that, you know, with a new agreement of of China to begin cutting its greenhouse gas emissions. So if if this really takes off. If uh, and and already you know we see like uh, the solar industry, the wind industry, they're booming all over the world. So That's if this right. gains momentum and steam, and and we really begin to make an impact in the next ten years or so, then yes. then we've got a chance. You know the we do. the world's still going to warm, but it's not going to warm in a way that that's going to threaten civilization necessarily. We'll be able to deal with it. We'll be able to adapt. But we really do need to start working on that seriously now because, uh, <laughs> yes. you know, I mean, yes. time is running out for these yes, things. It is. Yes, it really is. It really is. Well, Richard, I want to say that our time is running out here, too, at A Better World Radio with you. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's not at all an expression of how much I enjoyed your contribution, and I'm sure our audience did as well. It's uh, just always enlightening to speak with you and to enjoy your great learnedness and your commitment to a better future for us all. Very much well, appreciate it. Mitchell, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. The feeling is, is mutual, and the work you're doing is just wonderful. So keep well, it up. I know you, so you will. I will. I will. You too, Richard, and we'll have <laughs> you back again another time. Thanks again for everything. Thanks, Mitchell. Well, that was uh, quite a, a wonderful dialogue with my dear Richard Schiffman, friend and colleague for many years, who I've been watching just uh, to continue a metaphor, blossom in his work and his environmental uh, investigative reporting, which he has been doing. And uh, he's really reaching uh, an increasingly large audience uh, because of the different um, places that he's publishing these days. And so, you know, certainly do look him up, give a bit of a, you know, a Google search, and you will find Richard Schiffman out there. And uh, he really educates me a lot about the things that we were talking about here. So there is hope, my dear friends. There is actually a lot of hope. And Hope generates, in, including a, a physiology. Not only does it set the mind in the right direction, but it generates a physiology that's very healthy, that's very immune-building, that's very nourishing. Hope and gratitude and openness create an inner physiological field that can keep us, I guess the metaphors will continue, um, that will keep us generating for a long time to come the kinds of actions we need to become in accordance with our outer nature. Our inner nature becomes aligned with and harmonized with our outer nature. Our outer nature is what we call the the birds and the bees and the trees. And, you know, I began thinking the other day that if we were to think about trees as people, the chances of cutting them down would become vastly diminished. What do you think about them apples, huh? If we, I think that people feel bees inside themselves. It sounds so funny. And if you contemplate flowers, if you're in, you know, we call it nature, like nature is not us. I mean, to me, that's just one of the most hilarious kind of eggs on our face. The, the closer you look at a human being, the more you see that we are nothing but nature. I mean, in, in a sense, how could we be anything other than nature? It's just not not the cards. That's what we are biologically. And spiritually, you could even say that, you know, where does spirit come from or where does nature come from? Perhaps more accurately, if we're going to be a, a momentarily, uh, momentarily linear about it and chronological. Well, nature would come of spirit. And therefore, spirit is embedded in nature. And we are both. It's not one or the other. It's both and, and they're not separated. As, you know, the ancient Buddhist science says, form is 
uh, emptiness and emptiness is form in the Heart Sutra. Well, there's a physics basis to that comment. This is not just sweet poetry, although it's very poetic. (laughs) You see, there's actually a mathematics behind nature and a chemistry behind it and physics. And we can be aligned with that exquisite geometry. And when we are, miracles happen. And miracles, as St. Augustine said, are only those forces of nature with which we are not yet familiar. So, uh, again, we're dealing with our own mind, our own consciousness, of what is possible. And the more we open up that consciousness, the more that we open up our higher brain and our intelligence, the more possible can become what we refer to altogether too lightly as the miraculous. But the miraculous is available, and it's something, a a biological function, that we need to make very popular. I'm sure you're with me on this. You understand. So that means that since everything is energy, everything is nameable, everything has a frequency, and everything is mutable, we have in our own brain uh, neuroplasticity, a most important natural principle that has been further and further detailed and defined as time has gone on over these past 20 or so years of neuroscience emerging, showing us what's possible inside our own brain, which also then means, by definition, inside our own mind, because these two are inextricably linked at least at this point in time maybe forever and uh, so the expansion of one is also the teasing and expansion of the other the greater neural nets that we have the more possible is brilliant thinking and to observe that with consciousness just makes us all the smarter so I want to really uh, put forth the notion that a lot of our new intelligence needs to arise from our hearts. Because when we feel that bee inside us, when we feel those animals and those plants and those flowers and those trees inside us, there's no way we can kill them because we know that we are them. Or if there is going to be um, what we refer to as killing, There are ways that our native ancestors, the indigenous peoples of the planet, have done so in a loving, respectful, and sacred way. That's a very different way of killing. And uh, at that point, you know, it it takes on a different size and shape and dimension. Uh, That's for another show. But I know you understand what I mean. When we see all things inside ourselves, everything shifts. So on that note, I want to welcome you to a world of shifting, and I want you to know that on A Better World, that's what we're always seeking to do, is shift the consciousness of our listeners, of our audience, of our community at A Better World. So on that note, I want to just thank you all for coming by and listening in and taking this link from abetterworld.tv or from blog talk radio and uh, shipping it out to your friends far and wide enemies friends family alike it's all good because as reverend jesse jackson said we may have all taken boats different boats over here but we're all in the same boat now and uh, we have to learn to really swim or sink and it needs all decks All decks on hand. All hands on deck. A little verbal dyslexia. Anyway, I really do appreciate all of your attention to these incredibly, incredibly important subjects that we cover here on A Better World Radio, on Progressive Film Hour every Tuesday at 3 p.m., on Progressive Radio Network, uh, Gary Null's wonderful station, uh, and on A Better World TV 
every week uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Mondays. All of that is accessible at abetterworld.tv. And remember, for any of those of you who would want to engage me in counseling, coaching, therapeutic stress management services, I provide all communications consulting as well for uh, individuals, couples, and in business uh, from helping people articulate verbally what needs to be spoken as well as the written word, writing letters that are not easy to write, but uh, that's just one of my skill sets that I make available for um, commercial use. And so I can always be reached at 212-420-0800 or by email at mjr at abetterworld.net, mjr at abetterworld.net. Remember also that most of what we do is public service, it's our ministry on the air. It's our university on the air. And we encourage all of you to, to whatever extent you can, make donations at our website, be they monthly or one time or around the holiday. It's so welcome and so appreciated and used truly wisely in the name of perpetuating and sustaining a better world on the airwaves. So thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you all next.